So thank you very much for that introduction. And everyone can hear me OK? So far, so good. So um, as it was introduced, I'm really who's run around uh, North America a little bit. But the thing that unifies my interests is ectotherms at low temperature, how we can use understanding of low temperature limits to uh, understand the ecology and the range of different species. Um, but also, I just like this fictional character, I make my living by freezing things. So it's a great gig if you can get it. And I just kind of want to show you a little bit. Um, as you heard about my academic history, but just to kind of show you on a continental scale and introduce uh, you to me a little bit. I did my undergrad at University. I'm actually already uh, originally from southern Ontario. And at Acadia, we are right on an estuary on the Bay of Fundy. And you can see the intertidal zone there is really, really quite different than we get out here on the west coast. I then ran away for six years, I was at Western University with Brent Sinclair, um, really understanding the mechanisms of how especially insects, but also some other uh, terrestrial ectotherms, survive freezing and, and cold tolerance. I was lucky enough then to end up here at UBC uh, with Chris Harley. And Chris really taught me a lot about the inter rocky intertidal in particular. And so I was able to take some of the lessons I had learned from the terrestrial world over to UBC. I then. Uh, went to, to the University of Oklahoma. So uh, I did not study tornadoes, um, but I still continued my work on, on cold tolerance. I just had to really focus on terrestrial species. And now, just as of uh, last summer, I've ended up back here at UBC. And I'm, I'm really delighted to be back. And so this sort of academic history of mine also exemplifies my, my sort of research history and, and really how I'm interested in taking things that we've learned from one um, system, say the terrestrial sphere, over to the intertidal. Oh, hey, <laughs> that, that's all right. And, uh, and uh, really using those lessons to understand how things might work in the intertidal. And also, I think, some mechanisms of how things work in the intertidal over to terrestrial systems. So we're going to start with terrestrial work, and we're going to move into the intertidal. And in a way, it mimics my, my academic history. And one of the things um, from sort of a, an ecological perspective that I think is really fascinating is that every species has a, a particular range. It's not found everywhere. And so here we have a whole series of different uh, species of spruce budworm, including my very favorite, the eastern spruce budworm, here in yellow across Canada. And what's sort of fascinating is that there's something clearly that limits each of these species. In some cases, it's really obvious. So spruce budworm like trees. They don't like ocean. So we find them on land. They, some of them struggle with the Rocky Mountains as a, a geographical barrier. But broadly speaking, it's been hypothesized that equatorward limits are generally set by biotic interactions like uh, predation and parasitism. And polar range limits are set by abiotic factors, in particular, temperature. So I think this really sets up an interesting um, sort of hypothesis that cold tolerance might be a really, really important part for understanding what sets these polar range limits. And you know, it's kind of funny being a cold tolerance researcher in a time of rapid climate change. You're trying to justify your existence a little bit. But one way that I think about that is that um, actually, winters are changing really, really fast. So here we have uh, the amount of warming that's occurred over the last 60 years. And it's split up into uh, the warming in December, January, February, and the warming in June, J July, and August. And I think at least in the northern hemisphere, it's really, really clear that we have the most amount of warming actually happening in the winter months. So this means winters are changing faster than any other season. And if we want to understand the effects of climate change on animals, we really need to understand what's happening in winter. Another sort of interesting piece on this is that it actually turns out across invertebrates that generally we see poleward range boundaries expanding faster than equator uh, boundary contractions. So, and this kind of makes sense in the context of warming, that if most of the change we're seeing is in the winter, then some of these processes that happen in winter months are really important. So I think that what this does is sort of sets up a situation where to understand the effects of climate change on species distributions, we really need to understand limiting species on their poleward range edge and how that mechanistically works. So let's do that. We're going to start with some terrestrial examples. So here we've got, over time, 
and we're cooling down this cute little lady beetle. And as that lady beetle cools, it's going to go through a series of, of physiological events that we can sort of observe on the whole organism level. The first thing that's going to happen is it will enter a state of what's called chill coma. This is a reversible state of neuromuscular paralysis, so it just can't move. It can't respond to predators. It can't forage for food. And while this is reversible, so if you put an insect in your refrigerator, cool it down for a little bit, you bring it out, it looks like it's dead, it will revive given, given a uh, recovery time. But lots of species, if they spend too much time in the cold, will uh, chilling injury. And we still don't know a lot about the sort of physiological costs or causes of this, but most uh, ectotherms are going to um, really die of this chilling injury long before they ever have to worry about freezing. We call these species chill susceptible. Another set of species, what they do is they set their freezing point really, really to quite low temperatures. They don't worry about chilling injury. It doesn't seem to bother them. But if they freeze, they die. And these are our freeze avoidant species like my spruce budworm. And then finally, we have a whole other group of species, and this is what we're going to talk about today, the ones that survive freezing, ice formation actually happening in their body. Now, as you've been looking at this plot, you're probably wondering what this is, right? That little blip. This is real data uh, from freezing a, a, a goldenrod gall fly in my lab. So we stick a thermocouple on the gall fly, and as we cool it, it reaches something that we call the supercooling point. This represents when supercooling of body fluids uh, ends. And supercooling is just a state of being below your melting point, but still liquid. And so this is a bit of jargon, unfortunately, in the field. But it just think of this as a freezing point. And then when an animal freezes, it releases heat. All that potential energy in the liquid water is released as heat energy. And we can detect that just by measuring the temperature of the animal. And so we use this to know that the animal is actually frozen. Now, freeze tolerance is a really fascinating thing because it's actually happened multiple times throughout uh, evolution. So here we've got all the arthropod um, classes, and then within the insecta, all the uh, insect class, uh, orders that have actually, uh, we see examples of freeze tolerance. It's arisen multiple times independently. We also have freeze tolerant frogs, freeze tolerant turtles. Uh, tardigrades, of course, and freeze-tolerant intertidal animals like these mussels. And in fact, most mollusks that live in the intertidal, as well as the barnacles, are all, as far as we can tell, freeze-tolerant. So what I'm curious, uh, really wondering about is what role do low temperature physiological thresholds play in the ecology of the intertidal? And I think to answer this, we need to understand the causes and consequences of crossing low temperature thresholds like freezing. The other sort of reason that I, I'm interested in this is I think freeze tolerance is just a really fascinating trait. I'm going to try. I could sort of talk all day about freeze tolerance, but I think the best way to sort of show how interesting it is is to show a video. And uh, if I can't get it working there, I'll just bring it up here. Yeah. Sorry. One little moment as I sort this all out. Yeah. Yeah. My computer doesn't always play super well with these things, but here we go. And this is going to show a Jan and Ken story, who I've had the great luck of working with. They are uh, the grandparents of freeze tolerance here in Canada at Carleton University. These are the wood frogs that were caught last night. They've spent the whole winter on the forest floor, and most of that time they were frozen solid. I'm sure these frogs thought that they were all done with freezing for the year, but unfortunately they're not. We're putting them back in the freezer today. The freezer is set at 8 degrees below freezing, roughly the temperature of the ground in winter. In a matter of hours, they'll be hard as rocks. We have fully frozen Rana sylvatica wood frogs. They're probably 50-60% ice now. And their hearts are stopped, their brains are flatlined. Their, their limbs can't be moved, they would be broken up. Yet they're still alive. You can see one that's completely frozen still that we've just taken out. It's hard and crunchy. Whatever, whatever situation they were in last, they'll freeze in. This one's legs are frozen up. <laughs> 
and it's very hard and crunchy. But the most amazing thing is the fact that the wood frog comes back to life. Over a couple of hours, it makes a miraculous and complete recovery. Immortality. Yeah, and then it said some things about how if we sort this all out, then we can do this to humans, which I do not believe. But anyway, well, that's what the PLC gets to do. And so, now that we know a little bit about freeze tolerance, uh, one of the things uh, that we sort of do when we're interested in, in modeling the effects of temperature on organisms and their environment is we use the thermal performance curve. And... Uh, I enjoy criticizing it. This is actually a paper that I, I co-authored, so I can criticize my own stuff, right? Um, and basically, here we've got along the x-axis, and on the y-axis, we have some measure of um, a thermal performance. So this could be metabolic rate or fitness or anything else you want. And the way we usually think about this at the lower end is just this kind of like smooth decline, almost sort of an asymptotic relationship with temperature. As we get colder and colder, right, we eventually hit the CT min, that's the lower thermal limit of performance, and all is said and done. And really, I, I want to sort of convince you today that that's not the case. That's not when we look at, at the events that happen at these low temperatures, the way that things work. And one of the, the sort of ways that we link um, this sort of idea of thermal performance to the environment is through metabolism. So we, this is the sum of all biochemical reactions happening in the body. It's a way of getting at the energy use of an organism. And it's sort of this nice link between um, environmental temperature and individual performance in an environment. So what does metabolic rate look like at freezing? Well, this is uh, some work published um, back in the early 2000s on the goldenrod gallfly. Here we've got CO2 production as a measure of metabolic rate. And here we have two groups of golf flies at exactly the same temperature, just the one on the left is supercooled and the one on the right is frozen. You can see this discontinuity in the relationship between temperature and uh, metabolic rate, or energy use if you like, um, that's really mediated by this freezing threshold. So I really would argue to model the effects of temperature on organisms in their environment, we need to understand these nonlinearities. So in the wood frog, the way that uh, they survive freezing, we think, or at least some of the biochemical correlates, let's say, is by releasing glycogen from their, that's stored in their liver. This is a carbohydrate energy reserve. And get, it gets released as freezing approaches into glucose, into the bloodstream. So here we have, over the course of time, you can see liver glycogen drops and plasma glucose increases. And so, uh, Ken Story and, uh, and I were, and a group of us were really interested in what are these events that happen um, as we get this release of plasma glucose, and does this have an impact on the whole organism's energy consumption? This seems like a possibly energy, energetically expensive process. So what we did is we took wood frogs, we put them in a bath, and we cooled them down and froze them and measured their metabolic rate in real time as we did this. This is just an example trace here to kind of show you some of the interesting things that happened. Now, one thing I should mention, if you saw in the video, uh, they freeze the wood frogs on a wet paper towel. And that's because wood frogs only survive freezing if that ice is nucleated. So um, that damp paper towel works as a really nice ice nucleator. Now, we didn't want to do that because it might mess up our CO2 measurements. So what we did is we actually took little paint brushes and painted ice nucleating agents, uh, silver iodide, on their little feet which was my very favorite thing to ever have to do in grad school. And, uh, and that was how we nucleated ice. In the wild, they would be nucleated through moss. And so here we've got temperature on the, on the y-axis. Over, you can see several, this is a 24-hour period. And as we cooled down the frog, right, and here's the bath temperature and the frog temperature, you see we eventually hit the supercooling point of the frog. We get that increase in heat, right? So that heat production as all that water turns to ice. And then as we warmed it up again at the end of its freezing exposure, you can see an endotherm. So that's all that ice absorbing heat energy to convert to water. So during this period, the frog was frozen. 
So as we measured VCO2, what you can see is a couple of really interesting things happen during a freezing event. First, as we start cooling it, metabolic rate goes down. That's great. That's by our model, right? We get that slow decline in metabolic rate. And then all of a sudden, something weird starts happening. As the temperature drops, the VCO2, or the energy use of the animal, goes up. And it goes up and stays up as that animal is freezing. So this is excess energy use that we think is associated with survival of that freezing event. Now, some other interesting things happen here. Uh, so here, where you see it kind of smooth out really suddenly, that's when the ventilation of the frog stops, which I think is really fascinating. And then, of course, as we warm it up again, right, all of this is just CO2 exchange passively, right, from, from the skin to the environment. And here, ventilation begins again. So the, the frog was frozen, and then it starts taking its first breaths. And I just think that's the coolest thing. So what can we uh, learn from this? Metabolic rate increases just before and during freezing. And so freezing is a metabolically costly process. It's actually not explained at all by our thermal performance curve. And so what I wanted to do was take this extra cost, right, this extra metabolic um, uh, activity that we see with freezing, and see how does that match up with the amount of glycogen we know that uh, is in the frog's liver, which is one of its main energy stores over winter, we also uh, wanted to know if we took real air temperature from its environment, uh, how much uh, energy use would they, how many freeze thaws would they go through, and how much would it cost them? And I could show you some really nice graphs, but I'd rather show you this cartoon that JAB uh, did of our study. And basically, here we've got the two frogs getting ready for their winter. Um, sort of sleep it's showing here, and uh, says I've got 23 of these freeze thaw cycles I can uh, do. So this is what we found. On average, a frog in Ottawa uh, can survive freezing and thawing 23 times. The interesting thing is that that energy use associated with freeze and thaw actually made up a huge proportion of their whole winter energy budget. So if you think you've got to make it through six months of winter, understanding the metabolic um, energy costs of a freezing event, that nonlinearity, can really help us understand um, energy budgets for whole organisms over winter. And through my PhD, I, I looked at a whole sort of variety of different nonlinearities in, in lo, um, low temperature exposures using spruce budworm, the gall fly, uh, some woolly bears, all kinds of different organisms. And what I found was actually crossing these thresholds is, is either energetically costly or um, it can cause a lot of damage. And so I really um, think that these nonlinearities are worth thinking about. So freezing is an ecophysiological threshold. And what I wanted to do is sort of take some of these lessons from terrestrial animals and apply them in the intertidal. To do that, let's look briefly at how some of these mechanisms of freeze tolerance work. Now, as I mentioned, a freeze tolerance usually works by having an ice nucleating agent of some kind. This might be a protein, it might be environmental, it might be a bit of bacteria in the gut. But all survivable freezing only happens in the extracellular space. There's very, 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 I think there's like three known cells in the entire animal kingdom that can survive intracellular freezing. So when ice starts forming, uh, we have it propagate through the body. Ice forms are a really nice sort of template for more ice to form. And as all that water gets locked up into ice, the concentration of all the other solutes around the cell starts increasing. And so what happens is we need water to be transported out of the cell to the surrounding medium in kind of a controlled way. And we think aquaporins are really important for this. At the same time, we have our polyols and sugar, so like the glucose and the frog example. Other species use glycerol or trailose. They get pumped into the cell to help maintain cell volume. We think they also help uh, protect against the shock that happens. And then finally, uh, antifreeze proteins we think might be important in freeze tolerance. They uh, help keep ice crystals nice and small, and they also prevent ice crystals, we think, from forming within the cell. So this is a great model of sort of the terrestrial system. There's a few problems with it. One is we can have freeze tolerant species like this goldenrod gall fly that have very, very little cryoprotectin, about a tenth of what lots of other cold tolerant species have and no antifreeze proteins. At the same time, they have an incredibly low, low, lower lethal temperature. So they can survive freezing down to like minus 80, and they're fine. How they do it, we have no idea. 
On the other hand, we've got species that are not freeze tolerant, that have three or four times the glycerol that a golden rod gall fly does, and they also produce highly hyperactive antifreeze proteins. So clearly none of these things are the magic bullet for understanding what freeze tolerance is. There's no relationship between the amount of polyol and sugar having antifreeze proteins and survival of freezing. And here's the other thing, marine organisms don't seem to use any of those, those mechanisms at all. So this sort of leads us to the possibility that maybe by looking at marine organisms, we won't get sort of sidetracked by some of these other mechanisms, and maybe we could actually get at what you need to do to survive freezing. So I'm going to talk about two sort of small um, things that have to do with the intertidal and some of my research I did here with Chris Harley. First, applying some terrestrial lessons to the intertidal to try and work out some of the biochemical mechanisms of freeze tolerance using uh, mussels. And then secondly, some new ways of looking at old problems and using gene transcription to start looking for uh, new hypotheses for what could be the basis of, of freeze tolerance in, in marine organisms. So when I told people that I was going to go from London, Ontario, where we get pretty cold temperatures, to Vancouver to study freeze tolerance, I got some weird looks, right? Like, why would you go somewhere so warm? And the truth is, Vancouver and, in general, the West Coast probably has the greatest concentration of freeze tolerant biomass anywhere in Canada. And that's because all of these animals in the intertidal are freeze tolerant. So animals in the intertidal remain active and feeding year round, so they always have food in their gut that would nucleate ice, right? The other thing is that they have that constant um, ice or water present. So imagine, right, at low tide, the tide goes out, it's wet and damp. That dampness can form little ice crystals that form amazing ice nucleation agents. So just like the wet paper towel for the, the frogs um, forming a type of ice nucleator, same with the intertidal. Uh, marine organisms don't appear to accumulate these same cryoprotectants seasonally that uh, others do, so this seems like a good system for learning new things about freeze tolerance. And the intertidal, to bring it back to where I started, it's been sort of suggested as a bit of a model for understanding geographical sort of range limits, right? Because as we go up in the intertidal, uh, the amount of abiotic stress increases. And so it's been suggested that this upper limit of, of uh, species range in the intertidal kind of sort of is a nice model for a poleward range limit. So I started off by working with these guys, Middleus trosselus. Uh, they're the really common muscle we see fair around here in Vancouver. And they are very freeze tolerant. Seemed I can get them, like for me, you know, spending with the gall flies, I would like literally spend hours cutting individual flies out of galls, and it was like this big long process. Here I walk down to the beach, I like fend off some seagulls, and I can get all the freeze tolerant biomass I want, which is wonderful. So as we think a little bit about this, um, the sort of tidal, uh, the shore position, right, and whether or not we can use this as a bit of a, a model for what's going on at the continental scale, let's take a look at what the intertidal looks like. So here I've got through the month of January, I've got water height data, right, for that for the first couple of weeks. I've also plotted in yellow. This is daytime, and as we are all acutely aware, days are really short in January. But more importantly, the reason I wanted uh, to do this is what you can see is the very low tides actually happen in the middle of the night in, in Vancouver in January. So this means that those organisms, right, are going to be exposed to the extremes of air temperature when it's like 2 or 3 in the morning. We're all tucked, you know, nice and cozily in bed. We don't think about how cold it is outside. But all those animals in the intertidal are experiencing those extreme low temperatures. So, great. The other thing we can sort of look at as we do this is where the mussel bed is on this um, a, as a, a matter of shore height. So here we've got the top of the mussel bed, and we've got the bottom of the mussel bed. So as you might expect, the environmental conditions are really different for, for animals at the top versus the bottom. Here they've got longer exposures to air and uh, less time covered by the seawater, which is relatively warm compared to air temperature. It might be eight or nine degrees in the middle of January where the air temperature can drop below zero uh, easily. The other sort of interesting thing is that they're often, depending on where we are in the tidal cycle, they're going to get entire um, exposures to air that mussels in the bottom of the mussel bed are not going to get. So 
they're going to get more frequent immersions to air and more extreme air temperatures. So we can quantify this knowing um, this information about shore height and uh, water height. And so what we would predict um, for mussels in the high position, they would have much longer immersions and more of them through the year. So that number above the bar indicates the number of immersions. Knowing what we know about the supercooling point of mussels, we can actually figure out how many times in a year they would likely to freeze and thaw and how long those freezing events would be. So it's only about six times in each, um, each position, but the time spent frozen is much longer. Okay. So let's start off. Are mussels from the high shore position more freeze tolerant? Definitely so. So here they've got, they can survive down to about minus 12 on average, where mussels from the high shore position down to minus 9. So that's a pretty significant amount of difference in cold tolerance, given that we're talking a few feet walking distance on the shore. First off, that's nice to see. And it doesn't seem to be mediated by supercooling points. So they freeze at exactly the same temperature. They've got some kind of ice nucleating agent, so they freeze at a relatively high temperature. The other thing I was interested in is whether um, that freezing event itself was, was uh, more dangerous than actually staying frozen. So what I did is I gave um, some mussels four freeze thaws um, for two hours each. And another set, sorry, you can't see it down there, a single free exposure for eight hours. So same amount of time spent frozen. I just varied how many times I froze and thawed. And what you can see is that with cumulative freeze thaws, we get um, very, very low survival after even just four freeze thaw cycles. So this is really um, a big stress for them. So here in red, we have our individuals from the high shore and in blue from the low shore. This is uh, survival time in days and also uh, the number who survived as a percentage. What you can see is that repeated freeze thaw is bad regardless of whether you're from the high shore position or whether you're from the low shore. But a single freezing event is much, much more survivable if you're from the high shore than the low shore. So this suggests, again, that nonlinearity, right? As you um, cool, you're very, um, and hit that freezing threshold that is going to really change the relationship between temperature and, and organismal performance. So based on this, can we use this as a way of understanding the mechanisms of freeze tolerance in uh, marine bivalves? And can we use this in uh, freeze tolerance to, to really sort of figure out how this is working? So I had three hypotheses, and we're going to walk through them really quickly about what they meant and how we tested them. So the first is really uh, simple. This comes right from the terrestrial literature. We see freeze tolerant animals usually dehydrate as they go into winter. And so what I thought is maybe the mussels from the high shore are, have lower water content, so less freezable water. And so it's just less of a stress when they freeze. So that's easy to test. We've got proportion water here on the x-axis, tidal position, sorry, proportion water on the y, tidal position on the x. And you can see, if anything, it's actually the opposite of what I predicted. And this sort of makes sense. If you're high up on the shore, you're going to want to keep a lot more water around because you're, just, you're not exposed to water for very long, right? You don't want to dehydrate. So we can definitely toss that one out. The next is that perhaps anaerobic byproducts explain, um, are, function as a type of cryoprotectant. So when a muscle is out of the water, it's not, unable to breathe aerobically because it, its gills are not covered in water. And so what we see, and here I've got plotted here, um, the amount of succinate and malate, which are anaerobic byproducts in muscles, increases when the, the animals are out of the water. And so this kind of makes sense, right? If you're out of the water, you accumulate anaerobic byproducts, maybe those take the place of those polyol and sugar cryoprotectants. So uh, what we would predict is that hypoxia exposure should increase anaerobic byproducts. These byproducts should accumulate perhaps more in muscles from the high shore than the low shore to explain that difference. And hypoxia exposure should cause an increase in freeze tolerance. Okay. We're going to move on to the third hypothesis, because I tested it the same way as the second. This is the idea that organic osmolites could be explaining this. So back in the 80s, uh, some, uh, RSET took these mussels, they put them in 150% seawater, so really high salinity seawater, and they measured the osmotic pressure of the blood. And over the course of several days, the mussels matched the, uh, the osmolarity of the seawater. Makes sense. And as they did this, their survival time at minus 15, their freeze tolerance went up. OK. So maybe organic osmolites are important cryoprotectants for mussels. So in this case, we would expect mussels from the high shore position should have higher um, osmolites, so these taurine and, and betaine. 
And maybe they would increase after freezing exposure just to kind of hit, say, oh, hey, it froze. I should really you know, try and, and try and get this. So what did I do? I used uh, NMR metabolomics to measure the small organic solutes in, in uh, the gills of freeze-tolerant mussels. And I exposed the mussels first to normoxia or hypoxia. So I just removed them from water, kept them at, at the same temperature. And then uh, I either kept them in seawater as a control or froze them um, at minus 10. So what did I find? Anaerobic byproducts, we would expect, right? Hypoxia exposure should increase the production of anaerobic. And we should see it more in the high shore than the low shore. And I actually, I did see the first, which is nice, right? So anaerobic um, exposure, or hypoxia exposure increased anaerobic byproducts. So here we've got propionate and succinate as my anaerobic byproducts. But as you can see in red, I've got the high shore position muscles, and in blue, the low shore position muscles. No effect of shore position. And if anything, it's actually opposite to what I predicted. This really doesn't seem to be the case. Now, the, the major test, right, would be what if I just left them out of the air, um, out of the water for a really long time? What would that do? Well, uh, here I've got time spent out of the water. And they can do 48 hours out of the water and be perfectly fine, which is really, really cool. And then I expose them for two hours at minus 10 to see what, what effect this had on survival. And what you'll see here in blue, we have the control in the solid line and the immersed and the dashed. And in red, the high is the, um, the solid line is no hypoxia, and the dash line is the immersion. So out of air, uh, in hypoxia. And what do we see? Absolutely no effect of hypoxia on survival time. So um, hypoxia exposure didn't seem to cause a change in freeze tolerance. So that was literally everything that everyone um, in the literature had said for marine bivalves, this is what should actually cause freeze tolerance in marine bivalves, and no. So as you can imagine, as a postdoc, I'm like, no. So I'm like, OK, I've got one more hypothesis, right? Maybe this will like, the organic odds of life. Yeah, I, you, I hear like chuckling right here. You know it's going to happen, right? What did I find? I expected muscles from the high shore level should have higher taurine and betaine than muscles from the low. And maybe it should increase after freezing exposure. What did I get? The opposite. And this kind of makes sense, right? Muscles from the low shore position probably you know, are in seawater more of the time. So it kind of makes sense to me that they would have more of these osmolites. Um, and if anything, after freezing, we actually saw a bit of a decrease, if anything. So just no. Like, no on all three counts. So this was really frustrating. All three hypotheses that were from the literature, I was like, OK, these all rejected. So what now? And this is where it's helpful to go to a technique that can help generate some hypotheses um, and also think a little bit more protein sort of um, uh, mechanisms of freeze tolerance. So I was lucky enough to work with Benny Chan. He's a researcher at the Academia Sinica in Taipei. And every year, he goes on a research cruise to the White Sea in Russia. And he collects semi-balanous balanoides. And from British Columbia, I was able to get Balanus carnatus, actually from Calvert Island. And so what we did is we met up in Taiwan. We froze some barnacles. We extracted their RNA. And what we wanted to look at was what um, categories of gene transcription did we see following a freezing event. And one of the things that Benny has done is invented the robo-barnacle. So uh, here we've got a little I button data logger. You can extract the inner bits from it, stick it in a barnacle shell. And this allows you to really sort of accurately measure that a barnacle uh, would experience in its environment. So here we've got the White Sea on the left and Calvert Island here on the right. And one of the interesting things is that air temperature actually gets a lot colder than the body temperature of the barnacle. And this makes sense when you think about what's happening in the intertidal in really cold places. We've got big sheets of ice that come out. And if you haven't seen, uh, there's a new National Geographic show called One Strange Rock. And it shows the tide going in and out and the ice on top flexing and creaking. And I really, really recommend it. Um, I couldn't get, because of copyright reasons, I couldn't get a, a, a version for you all to see. But I really, really recommend it. But either way, what you can see in general is the White Sea here in the sort of temperatures that the robobarnacle experiences are much warmer um, than the air, air temperature. And also, the robobarnacle is still 
probably experiencing several freeze-thaw cycles, where on Calvert Island in BC, it tends to be pretty warm. And so as a result, we expected we might see a difference in freeze tolerance between these two species. And that's exactly what we saw. So here on the x-axis, we have exposure temperature, minus 10 and minus 6, survival on the y, two-hour exposure. And what you can see is that semi-balanus balanoides is significantly more freeze tolerant than balanus carnatus. Great. Now that we can use this information to set up an experiment to look at gene expression following freezing. So here we've got temperature, we've got our cold exposures, and we use an exposure to minus 6, so it should be survivable. And then we um, measured, uh, we took samples at 6 hours and 26 hours um, from the start of the experiment. So of work in between that previous slide and this slide, if you've done a gene transcription work, you know we assembled transcriptomes for each of the species. We did all the, all the bioinformatics on 100 gigs of data that you would expect. So I'm going to just kind of take you right here to the number of differentially expressed genes. And, and those of you who've done that work will, will forgive me. Um, so the time after the freezing start on the X, and then the number of transcripts differentially regulated on the Y. And each uh, species was uh, compared to its own control. And what we can see is that generally the semi-balanus balanoides is, so that more cold tolerant species is kind of, yes, it's perturbed by the freezing event, but it's, if anything, it's kind of coming back down. Whereas on uh, balanus carnatus, we see this increase in dysregulation as the more time goes on, and this is a log scale on the y-axis. So what were the things that we saw? So what were the functional sort of enrichment categories? One of the interesting things uh, that was downregulated was electron transport chain components. It sort of makes sense to downregulate that to uh, um, re reduce the amount of damage potentially after that freezing event. We saw a lot of heat shock proteins, ma macrophage mannose receptors, and I'll get back to that in a minute, and also things that had to do with glycerol and cellular water transport. These were our aquaporins. So, so it's the first time there's been any suggestion that they might be important in freeze tolerance in intertidal animals. On the, in our less cold uh, freeze-tolerant animal, we see less of that downregulation of the electron transport chain. We see uh, some of these macrophage mannose receptors and then a lot to do with proteolysis. So sort of things that make sense in the context of protein damage after freezing. So what's going on with these macrophage mannose receptors? Well, you know, this is what, what the autom patient told me they were, but if we dig a little bit deeper, this is a type of C-type lectin, so a, le a carbohydrate binding protein that relies on calcium. The cool thing about this is that these uh, C-type lectins are the source of type 2 antifreeze proteins, and if you really sort of start digging into the blast results from these transcripts, you see they actually, one of the things that they blast really well against are the type 2 antifreeze proteins that are actually uh, used by Atlantic herring. So that's really, really interesting. And some of the really cool stuff about antifreeze proteins is their path of root of evolution is really something that has been under a lot of investigation lately. Even a couple of weeks ago, there's a great paper that came out um, really looking at the evolution of antifreeze glycoproteins. These C-type lectins is thought to be a case potentially of convergent evolution. And so if so, this is a case not only do they uh, evolve in, in fish, but we're also seeing them in invertebrates that are exposed to these more extreme environments. So one of the things to th uh, think about with, uh, with cold exposure is it's not just the cold that could potentially cause damage to protein. So along here on the x-axis, the temperature, and on the y, this is sort of a, a measure of how favorable it is for a protein to fold. And where this value is above zero, we expect the protein to be happily folded, and below zero, denaturation of the protein to happen. So at low temperatures, proteins also denature because the sort of water shell around them actually lowers in density, and that can actually, um, so there's less of that hydrophobic effect, keeping them folded up in their correct position. So that could be one cause of why we see protein damage in our, our less uh, freeze-tolerant species. It also could just be the osmotic shock, right, of all that dehydration as water gets locked up into ice that could also potentially cause protein denaturation. So we don't know the answer for exactly how that's happening, but we know that our very freeze-tolerant um, species is able to upregulate lots of heat shock proteins to either prevent or repair some of that damage, and they use aquaporins, and this is our first uh, example of that. 
are less freeze tolerant species, producing lots of proteases. We think lots of protein damage probably happened and little in the way of heat shock protein. So they're just, they're really, really um, stressed out. Both species, we think possibly uh, we're seeing new antifreeze proteins and maybe some suggestion of, of glucose accumulation. This is all at the transcript level. And so where does this sort of leave me? It leaves me with lots and lots of questions, which is a great place to start in a, a new faculty position. So the intertidal is this really, really fascinating place where freezing is it's a constant threat, and it's a fascinating place to study the importance of these low temperature thresholds and to really get at some of these unanswered questions about the mechanisms of freeze tolerance. So now that I'm back, there's three things that I really want to focus on. One, how do intertidal invertebrates survive freezing? What are those mechanisms, right? I, I knocked off a bunch of hypotheses, and now I have some new ones, right, from, um, from some of the uh, transcriptomics work. So why don't we start doing some protein um, functional work? Can, do we see aquaporins actually expressed? Do we see antifreeze proteins? Can we isolate them? Are they seasonally variable? There's tons of new questions that we can ask. Secondly, I think I'd like to go back to some of my older work on freeze-thaw and energetics. Is freezing a discontinuity in that relationship between metabolic rate and temperature um, in, in intertidal invertebrates like it is in insects or in frogs? And then thirdly, and this is sort of the big one that will keep me busy for a really long time, is, is freezing uh, what, one of the things that sets some of that, those upper intertidal zone limits. So we know that um, they're not entirely, you know, there's lots of area where we don't see organisms where the tide still comes up. So it, does freezing play a role in the existence of that upper limit? So I've been lucky enough to work with a lot of really great researchers, uh, to be funded by some great funding sources, and I am so excited to be back at UBC and to get, be getting back at some of these uh, questions. So thank you for your time today.